other things that were big elements of this book. Gender and sex. I know a Victorian woman artist, a modernist woman artist. These are all unusual, but there was a lot of discussion about whether or not a woman can draw or paint as well as she does. I'm just looking for one example of one of her paintings, mm, which I think was maybe a silk print or a, um, a print. Okay, I'm going to pull you, around. Whoa. pull you around this way and see if you can see this reproduction in black and white of La Toilette by Mary Cassatt, 1891. It's now in the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art and it was an aqua tint, that's it. And I think you can even see here, of this aqua tint, Degas remarked, quote, I will not admit that a woman can draw that well. <laughs> I will not admit that a woman can draw that well. <sighs> like he's intimidated, like as if, oh women are incapable or that she is so good she becomes a man it reminds me of people saying the uk didn't have a female prime minister because they don't consider thatcher a woman so there's this line this is just a reproduction in black and white and maybe you can see the line of the back of the lady bending over her bathroom bowl to wash her face. There's a very, very thin line that illustrates the curve of her back and the biographer talks a lot about this line because a lot of people in the art world talked about this line and how it was so talented and it was just so well executed and it really made people sit up and listen to Mary Cassatt as an artist and it reminded me of the way I like to use a single line in my portraiture and I consider it like Mero said taking a line for a walk but it made me sad because there were all these men's voices shouting about how astonishing it is that a woman could draw such a line. And on page 220 there was also a big discussion about how Mary's hard work was masculine in her day because a lady did not work such long hours unless she didn't have enough money, quote, reduced circumstances, unless she was in reduced circumstances and she had to. So not having to work and sorry, having to work that many hours and being in reduced circumstances were things to be ashamed of. So it wasn't until after the First World War that holding a job was considered cachet. So the biographer argues that in this way, Mary Cassatt was ahead of her time because she sat down in her art studio and she worked from nine in the morning till five at night or whatever, or took a long break for lunch. Um, but worked as if she had a day job. And the biographer talks a lot about how different Mary Cassatt is to other women of her day. I just don't appreciate the idea that autonomous work is a masculine trait, or that having long hours masculinates this woman. There was a thin line where the biographer could have been talking about gendering the artist, Mary Cassatt, and applying a concept of gender to her that she didn't apply to herself. There are times where 
how tall she is is referred to as masculine, how independent she was referred to her as masculine, how many hours she worked referred to her as masculine, the fact that she didn't marry. Um, I don't like that in those days all these things were considered masculine and then to do the opposite would be emasculating I feel like we're losing a bit of the nuance in what hard work looks like and there's also a debate here that goes on in the art community, which is like how much you sacrifice of your domestic life is indicative of how great an artist you are. Okay, I just want to comment on, what was it, page two, two, three? Um, Mary Cassatt is known for a lot of paintings of women and children. She herself didn't have a child. She often drew on what it was to be a child, to be in her mother's arms. And I think she took a little bit of Degas' advice, which was be a woman who paints maternal scenes and you will have kind of a brand. But she went to Egypt with her family on a long tour <clears throat> and she was really stunned by Egyptian art and how different it was to the art of the Impressionists that she worked with. So page 233 it writes, suddenly fantastically her letter reveals an utter bouleversement. The vocabulary of this biographer. Then in this country, Cassatt goes on without a break, it's art, Egyptian art. How overpowering. Fancy going back to painting babies and women. I am glad Mr. Stillman will pose for me. He wanted me to paint him last year. I did not feel equal to a man's portrait, but now I must to work off, if possible, this overpowering impression, brackets, of masculinity. I am crushed by the strength of this art. I wonder, though, if I can ever paint again. It goes on later down the page. I'm not even sure if I can pronounce the vocabulary of this biographer. She says, What on earth was there about the Egyptian experience, apart from anxiety, to precipitate such total enantiodromia? That means a changing of the road. Romeo means road. I think it means about face. By a kind of affinity through a voice that spoke to her across the millennia, Mary Cassatt had found her new thing, all right, but it was anything but a calm and peaceful advent. So the author tries to use this trip to Egypt as a way to explain how Mary Cassatt understood that there was a way to progress in her art, to be inspired and to develop, but she didn't know how to grab it with both hands and move forward and develop as an artist herself. And it feels as if Mary Cassatt had been a part of the Impressionist movement and then was too intimidated by the intensity of Egyptian art to incorporate that into her own style in any way or to move forward with that as an inspiration. Um, so there's this other dichotomy in this book, which is between Impressionism and other art that comes after it. 